Hi, so it's great to be here today. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer for putting up this great meeting. And I'd like to start by showing you this small device. You probably know about it. It's uh, an insulin pen. So when you have diabetes, your pancreas is not working anymore. It's not making insulin. And so you're not metabolizing glucose. So what you do when you're going to eat, you measure your blood glucose, then you look at what you eat, and then you inject some insulin inside your body. Now, you don't want to inject too much, because otherwise you can go low glucose level and go into coma. So today, we have several million people on the planet who go through this process for every meal, every day, and for the rest of their lives. So instead of doing that, now imagine if we could take some living cells and we could program them to grow into a new pancreas, a functional one, that we could use to replace the broken one. And so that would be a great change uh, in all these people's lives. And this is just one example of what we could do if we were able to program living cells. And so today, I'd like to share with you our research on trying to do so. So I'd like to start by putting the substrate we're working with, biology, into a larger perspective. So biology and living organisms appear pretty early um, in the story on these planets. And through billions of years of evolution, they become incredibly complex and diverse. So now, if you look at we as a species, we appear pretty recently. But however, we are able to use our brain to invent tools and technologies that really helped us improve our lives. So basically, by our capacity to invent tools and technology, we are able to go from living into caves to sending men to the moon. And along all this process, we have depending on the living world around us to survive, either for our food, or for our clothes, or importantly, for our medicines. Now, we didn't only use the living world around us. We could actually, we found that we actually can shape it. So by making the process of evolution, we found that we could select desired traits, for example, to get better crops. And by the end of the 60s, researchers found that all organisms on this planet that we know of use DNA and the same genetic code and the same way of executing it. And at the same time, at the beginning of the 70s, researchers find a way to cut and paste this DNA. And so the reason, hey, is the code is the same, if I take one species, I take a gene and I put it into another, then this should work. And indeed, thanks to genetic engineering, now instead of taking insulin from pigs or gross hormone from cadavers, we actually pasted this gene into microbes and now we just brew them. And today we're even capable of pasting more genes to make more complex molecules. So that was a great achievement and that changed a lot of things. But you can see we're really far away from the complexity we can see in nature, actually. So how do living organisms can achieve such complexity? And basically, to do that, they compute. So you can see here, this cell from your immune system is, is actually pursuing a bacteria. And it's actually capable of sensing it, following and changing its direction until it finally destroys it. So there's some decision making going on here. There's some computation. Another example is during development, when you go from an egg to a full organism, you follow a very precise series of steps. It's like a computer algorithm. Biologists call it a developmental program. So today, we are really far away of being able to program such complex behavior inside living cells. But we can imagine what we would like to do if we could. So as I said, instead of using insulin for diabetes or making dialysis for kidney failure, you could actually program cells to develop and grow different kind of functional organs that could replace the broken ones. That's something we'd like to do. Another example is when you have cancer, you have some bad cancer cells and some good cells inside your body. And you use chemotherapy, and you basically destroy your cancer cell, but you also attack the good ones. So instead of doing that, it's pretty brutal, can we actually take a cell and program it to search and destroy specifically cancer cells? So now you can see the capacity to program living cells can really make a lot of changes in the way we live. So how do we do that? How do we program living organisms and living cells? So first, uh, we have to look out natural living system compute. So basically, 
cells are used with hugely complex networks of protein, uh, which are interacting together and then being shaped by billions of years of evolution. So they're not made for us to understand or even to engineer. It's really hard. So can we find a way to actually make artificial networks of biological molecules that allow us to program living cells in a way we understand? And it turns out something we know very well to program are computers. So computers, we know this very well how to do it. So can we use concepts from computer science, from electronics, to program living cells? So if we want to do that, first we need to look at computers operate. And, and as mentioned previously, in computers you use binary numbers, 0 and 1, two states. And this has been a very successful framework for more than 200 years. So we know how to use that. So the question is, how do we write 0 and 1 into living cells? So I started this work uh, when I was in the lab at at Stanford. And what we did use this enzyme, they call integrases, and they recognize a specific sequence on the DNA, these small triangles here. And what they do is that the integrase, they go, they bind to the DNA, and then they flip the sequence, which is in between these sites. So here, in between the sites, you have this arrow, which is pointing the way toward genes should be expressed. So here it's pointing toward the green fluorescent protein, and the cells are green. Now, I can add a chemical to the cells, the cells are going to make the integrase, and integrase go to the DNA, flip the DNA in between, and now you can see the arrow is pointing toward the red fluorescent protein. So the cells are red. So now this is interesting. We have this digital device, we have two states, like a zero and a one. So now we can compute uh, within living cell. So how do we do that? Well, we go back to computers, and to program computers, we basically use logic gates, Boolean logic gates. So this gate, they open to two inputs, and they give an output according to the logic function. So an example is an AND gate, where you're going to have an output, only the two inputs are high. So then you take this logic gate, you combine them in different manners to make more complex computation. Physically, these gates, they are built using transistors. So in a transistor, you have this control signal here, which controls the flow of current through the wire. And to make a logic gate, for example, an NAND gate, you can put two transistors and put them in series. And you need to have control signal A and control signal B for the current to flow through. So the question is, can we actually build a transistor operating in living cells? And what would be our biological current? So now if we turn into biology, inside your cells, you have your DNA, and you have this enzyme. It's called RNA polymerase. And it's constantly sliding along the DNA. Now, when it finds a gene, it makes this RNA molecule, which serves as a template for making all proteins in your cells. And proteins make a lot of different functions. So basically, you can see there's a clear link between this flow of RNA polymerase and cellular functions. It's like our biological current. So we want to build a biological transistor that allows us to control the flow of RNA polymerase along DNA. And because this process is called transcription, we're going to call it a transcriptor. So now, how do we do that? Well, we flip DNA. So you can recognize here this triangle, with a side that are recognized by the integrase. And in between these sides, we have a T. It's a transcriptional terminator. It's a DNA sequence that blocks RNA polymerase. So in this state, the polymerase runs through the DNA, but it's blocked by the terminator. It cannot reach the gene and, and express it. Now, I add a chemical to the cells. Um, the integrase goes on and flip this terminator. And what's interesting, this is an asymmetric terminator, so it works only one way. Now you flip it, it's inactive, and the polymerase can go through and now express the gene, makes RNA, makes protein, makes function. So we have a genetic switch here, and like a transistor in electronics, it's capable of amplifying signals. So now we can make logic gates. So for example, to make an end gate, I put two transcriptors in series with two different terminators. On the DNA, they're controlled by two different integrases. And now you need to flip both terminators for the polymerase to go through. So we have a fluorescent protein. And you can see the cell only glow when you have signal A and signal B. So that's an end gate. Now we can do other gates. We can do X or exclusive or, where you have an output only if the two inputs are different. And here's a bit different. We place this terminator between two pairs of sites. And that we, when we express one enzyme or the other, you flip the terminator, the gene is on. But when you express both enzymes now, the terminator go back to this original place, and the gene is off again. And you can see the cells that are just glowing 
exclusively if you have signal A or signal B. Now, we made several other logic gates. We call them Boolean integrous logic gates or build gates. Um, and we put them in the public domain so that people can reuse them and improve on them. So now we have these tiny amounts of computation working in living cells with some signal amplification. So what can we do with this? So I started my lab last year at the Center for Structural Biochemistry in Montpellier, France. And our goal is to use this cellular computer for diagnosis. So the idea is to take this engineering bacteria that could be incubated in clinical samples, and then they can detect biomarker of disease. And then they can perform some computation to identify a specific biomarker signature that corresponds to a pathology, and then give a signal. Now here we're taking advantage of the great sensitivity and specificity of biological systems. We use our logic gates for computation. And importantly, we have with biology a self-fabricating technology. So if we can engineer a test, now we can grow it, and we hope that that using this technology, we can bring sophisticated diagnostics to many people for many applications and in settings where they're not currently available. So we are uh, lucky that several people believe in this work and, and are supporting us. So the first thing we wanted to do with our collaborators in Stanford and Montpellier was to show that we could use our system to actually detect a disease. So here, we took a glucose sensor from a bacteria which can sense glucose, but gives a very weak signal. It's not really something we can use. And we take it in and we plug it to our transcriptor, so we amplify the signal from glucose. So now you can see we put this bacteria into beads, and when you add glucose to the beads, then the beads turn red. They make this red fluorescent protein. Now we take these beads, and we put them in the urine of patients, uh, control patients, who don't have glucose in their urine. And you can see is the fluorescence intensity here is very low. Now, we take these beads and we put them in urine of patients who have unstabilized diabetes, meaning they still have glucose into their urine. And now you can see that uh, the fluorescence is going up, so we are able to take glucose and diabetes using a bacteria. And that's the first example of a bacteria which is able to detect a clinical relevant signal into human samples. So this is obviously a first step. There's a lot of work to do, and, and we're working hard to actually push this system sophisticated so that we can really hopefully change the way and the scale at which we can envision diagnostics. What we hope also is that beyond diagnostics, our work will have several ramifications in different fields of healthcare. By enabling the programming of living cells, we could use the systems for in vivo diagnostics, or making cellular therapies, or also engineering the microbiome, so the good bacteria that live inside us and that we think we can harness to fight several diseases. So this is just one example of how the ability to program living cells can really make profound changes. And now we are developing this new technology and bringing it to many species so that we're making the living world around us programmable. So we're doing that right now very fast. This is happening in universities, this is happening in the industry, and it's also happening in the public. You have students in engineering biology, and we also have the do-it-yourself bio movement, garage biology, where citizens, not scientists, are engineering biological systems to solve practical problems and potentially improve our lives. And now we are, know that when you have a new technology like this, it comes with some benefits, but it also comes with some costs. We know this very well from nuclear energy or synthetic chemistry. And now we are developing this new power, this great power. And as you know, with great power, comes great responsibility. So now, this is one of the main challenges we're facing in the field. We're working hard to try to solve it, but we need everyone's help to do that. So I'd like to pose this challenge to you as a crowd. How do we innovate responsibly? As a society, what kind of mechanisms do we put in place? What kind of culture do we have to build so that we enable many people to keep innovating and improve our lives, while at the same time, we fulfill our responsibility. Responsibility toward future generations, responsibility toward different communities, but also our responsibility toward our planet and the living world we're sharing it with. So how do we innovate responsibly? Thank you. <laughs>